welcome back to our number two and this will boast to be a very exciting hour last hour was oh, very exciting as well exciting it was all statistics and i'm your host katrina madewell joined by mr leo kane with barrel engineering and inspections protect what matters most your family and we're also joined by our special guest for the hour and also a call in so we got michael baum here in the studio welcome good morning it's a pleasure thank you for coming we also have uh jamie kozar she's joining us by phone a little bit jet lag this morning right yes i am good morning everyone welcome Welcome, welcome. So let's talk a little bit about what you guys do. So the name of your company is Society Wine Bar, right? That is correct. You guys have been around for seven years. And uh, tell me a little bit about what you guys do and how you got your start and where this whole concept came about. Well, we started us. Go ahead. Society Wine Bar Franchise Group. We've been around since 2012. We opened our first location in Ybor City. Then we moved to Seminole Heights, and most recently we opened up in South Tampa. And we've begun franchising in 2018 and sold three markets so far. And how many locations do you have now? We own three personal corporate stores. We have a territory in Sarasota, Brandon, and um, the Channel Side District that we're still, that are still under development. So this is so awesome. So tell me a little bit about Society Wine Bar. What, when you um, come into your ex, your into your experience, we'll call it that. How like what can I expect? Obviously, it's a wine bar, but what makes you guys a little bit different? We have 200 wines by the glass. That's probably one of those the most extensive BTG by the glass programs nationwide. 100 craft beers. Michael is the curator of our craft beer program. He can talk more about that and then small cake. Awesome. So you'll have like hummus, salsa, spinach dip, yeah. cheese board, appetizer type stuff that goes very well Absolutely. with wine and craft beer. Absolutely. A lot of fun uh, different cheeses. The cheeses always change on a uh, daily basis, um, even from hour to hour. Beer program is fairly extensive, which is very surprising and unexpected for a wine bar. So, Jam Jamie, tell me what's your role at Society Wine Bar? I'm the CEO and founder. Um, Society Wine Bar was my vision and my brainchild. In 2012 with Ybor City, I came out of retirement and opened Society Wine Bar as a hobby. So where did the whole idea come up, come about? Like what, what made you want to do it? I owned a restaurant for 27 years in Miami. So we, I grew up in uh, an Italian restaurant knowing about wine, having a passion for wine. So I just combined my, my master's degree and my love of fine wine and put the business model together. I love it. And what's your role, Michael? What do you do? I uh, am the CFO, so okay. I pretty much all things numbers, and I also curate the beer menu, as uh, Jamie mentioned. So you were excited about last hour, right? You love yeah, those I guys. do enjoy the numbers. I enjoy the finance See, talk and economics. The show. Of course, I'm surrounded by two and engineers. I love it. Actually, to fo uh, follow up on why how our passion started, it was actually really coincidence because it was almost nine years ago at a little wine shop in uh, Fort Lauderdale in Wilton Manors, uh, the best seller with Richard Stetler, where I actually met Leo Kane for the first time drinking wine, and it was his uh, wine tastings where we got the inspiration for the wine bar. Yeah, it was actually pretty neat because what would happen in Fort Lauderdale is he his model down there was he had, it wasn't really a wine bar, it was a wine store, but he did a sit-down wine tasting five nights a week and you would sample 12 wines during that tasting and then you would end up buying three or four bottles of each of them because you're blacked out by the end of the night. <laughs> so they t took that model, shifted it more towards a, um, more towards a, a bar restaurant type style where you can come in and you have all these glasses to choose from. You can buy bottles, you can open them, you can buy bottles, take them home. And they also do a sit down. So they took the best of that Fort Lauderdale model and they created something even better. Yeah, where Richard was doing his uh, five or six nights a week, we uh, in the Ybor City location, we have our Wednesday night wine societies in uh, Seminole Heights. It's on Thursday nights. And in South Tampa, that uh, location does it on Tuesday nights. Every on those Test start times are at 7 p.m. So if you like to wine more than one night a week, you can move around. Exactly. <laughs> I love it's it. It's very entertaining, too. I mean, it, part of the uh, sit-down wine tasting is always the show element, uh, the showmanship. Uh, if you're going to bring a guest speaker in, you're going to bring a guest brewer or a, a, a guest harvester or what, what's the term I'm looking for? A vintner or a, a winemaker. Um, and if not, they have their in-house psalms, which are people that have taken multiple tests and become experts in wine, uh, they have 
them that gives a presentation to tell you all about what you think you should be tasting in a glass. So is it, uh, give me an idea what the, like if I were to walk into any of your locations, am, is there always going to be a presenter there? Is it a little bit different depending on the night of the week or the location? Yes. We always have a certified sommelier on staff, and we can give you that same experience anytime you come in. We're all about education, and we feel that education really highlights and heightens your experience. When you understand what's in your glass, for example, if this is Italy in the glass, or Spain, or France, and we tell you the nuances between old world and new world, et cetera, et cetera, it heightens the experience and the appreciation. So you, of the occasion. It sounds like you've made a little bit of some of the experience you would get if you were in Napa or Sonoma right here in Tampa. Is that fair? Exactly like you were in the tasting room. For sure. That's an excellent descriptor. And if you if you've ever if you ever had those experiences like I have, they're pretty cool. Like it's a very unique experience in and of itself. And um, so, how to, tell me a little bit about how your first year went, right? So it started as a hobby. You've got a master's degree, well-rounded, and a lot of education in the restaurant space, which is really important. That's a has a very high failure rate. Definitely very high um, failure so rate. So tell me a little bit about how you set yourself up to succeed. And then tell me a little bit about, you know, when you decided, hey, this would be a great idea to franchise. Okay. Excellent question. Just to speak to that for a moment, the restaurant that I owned in Miami Beach was there for 27 years. So the longevity, uh, you're right, is very, very important. Um, we were very fortunate. People were a little skeptical prior to us opening up the Ybor City Wine Bar. They thought there wasn't a market or a culture of wine, and Michael and I thought, we can't be the only people in Ebor City, right, Leo, that like fine wine. Yeah, I mean, you have other places in Ebor that, that serve wine, but not a wine bar. And I mean, this and you came in before the brewery expansion. Like, we had a craft brewery explosion. We have Beer House that just opened last, last week. We have um, Zydeco, which opened last year. Copper Tail, which has been around for five or six years. Rock Brothers, three years old. So you, you might have actually helped bring about the craft beer movement in Ebor City because of the success of the wine bar. That we had when we first were in there, they were at fifty percent capacity. Not even. They're at hundred percent capacity now. Yeah, not even. We changed the face of, of Ebor. But we, Michael and I, certainly thought certainly we can't be the only people that like fine wine. Fill it and they will come, and that's exactly what we did. We I love it. And they came. Yeah, they found us. Jamie, can I go back to one of the comments that you made earlier? You said you had a really successful place in Miami for 27 years. From your experience as the owner of the restaurant, and in, we talked about how that failure rate's really high, what do you think it takes to be successful for over 20 years in a business such as this or restaurant? Consistency is key, in my opinion. That's very, very important. Getting the same experience and the same quality every time. That, that's very important. A lot of restaurants are inconsistent, so they're hit or miss, so then the guest is undecided whether they want to come or not. Oh, should we go here or there? Oh, wasn't that great the last time, et cetera, et cetera. Them realizing that they're going to get a, 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 a rock star experience every time they come and maintaining that quality is critical. Is, is, there, so did it. is there anything else, and do you guys spend yes. time as the owners there in the restaurant? Yeah, there's definitely that, but there's, a, there's one thing that I learned about guests and servicing our guests and what we need to do is what we like to do is limit customer complaints and confusion so there's a little mnemonic i found at a bank which is no longer in business <laughs> <laughs> let's quote something that's yes. no longer in business about customer yeah, service but no it's actually great and it says that you can avoid almost all customer complaints if you treat everybody who comes through these doors as guests but what does it mean as to be a guest well you have g which is greet so you greet the person coming in through the door. You understand the guest's needs. All right, once you understand their needs, you can then educate them on their product. So there's your GUE. Then you can suggest a product for your guest. Then you also thank them for, com for coming in and being a guest. And if you can do that, you can successfully avoid confusion. And when you avoid confusion, you can build a relationship and there is a, um, an understanding between the two of you, and there will be no customer complaints. That's actually that's solid. I, I mean, if no, I, I love that you mentioned that, and I'm going to talk about a wine experience that I had personally, and I'll tell you why I didn't go back there. We spent a lot of money there, and that place is actually now closed. 
I couldn't imagine. So we're going to talk about that right after the break, if that's okay with you guys. And then we'd love to talk a little bit more about why you chose Ebor City and a, a few other things along that lines. Absolutely. You're listening to Tampa Home Talk. We'll be back in just a moment. Our off-air number, 813-377-2775. Well, good morning. Welcome back. Leo Kane here with Barrel Engineering and Inspection, with joined with Katrina Madewell from Tampa Home Talk. We've got uh, Michael Bohm here from the Ebor Wine Soci Society Wine Bar. Sorry, calling Spit Elvin. it out. And then we've got Jamie Kosar on the phone, also from the Society Wine Bar. So I love that you guys brought up your whole, what was the analogy, what was it, what did it spell? Guest. Like guest. Greet, guest. understand, educate, suggest, think. I love it. I love how you kind of think through what that model will be and think about from your customer's perspective. I just want to share a little bit of a story with you because I think you'll appreciate that. And I think the person listening will appreciate it. And perhaps what you guys offer is a little bit different. But there was a little place in uh, Land Lakes, which is close for us. And um, they offered, you know, kind of like that wine bar experience. Yeah. But you could also go make wine was part of their process oh, right wow. so i thought Step well the grapes and everything well i mean not it wasn't quite that come back much, nine months but to drink we would it later. stir the wine and <laughs> bottle it and cork it it was a pretty fun experience so what we did was you know we like to offer like a vip experience for some of our regular people that come through with us we've had several transactions with them they have referred many people to us and they've just been overall really good clients for many years so we'll do different things at different times and to give them a little bit of a vip experience because you know we just we want to treat them well and let them know that we appreciate them so what happened was we ended up doing a wine making experience with our team we invited a group of some of these people for both parts the first part and the second part. First part went really well. And I will tell you, I spent about a thousand dollars both times that I was there um, between the wine That's that we a nice purchased. Little, uh, party. Between the mm -hmm. wine that we purchased and the every you know, the whole experience that we did. And um, the second time that we went back, it's the little things, right, that matter. But what happened was the second time we went back, we were we were bottling, labeling labeling and um, you know, taking some of our wine home. Yeah. And, or the first time my team did it, there was actually three times. And then the second time we bottled, corked, and labeled. And then the third time we came back and just did a little pickup party, had some wine and that sort of stuff. So what happened was, the, and the, the lady that owned the place knew that I was paying for this, right, for my people. And I had a certain budget in mind, and I kind of wanted to stay within that budget. So what happened was, and this was actually a third time, which we weren't really planning on, but we just kind of did it, so the budget was way lower. One of the guests... Um, that we invited asked for a bag, like a to-go bag to take their wine. Reasonable enough request, right? You yeah. have two, three, four, five bottles. Well, what I didn't you know, a box for that. what I didn't know <laughs> was that they were going to charge me $8 a bag and then just add it onto my tab. And then when one person asked for it, another one asked for it, then they just started passing them out and they added it all to my tab. And so I said, Hmm, can you can we talk a little bit about this? Because I didn't agree to pay for, you know, all the bags, eight dollars a piece on top of everything else we've already paid for. Were like cloth bags, like nice little wine like tote bags. Their advertisement, right? With their logo on yeah. it and, and like I the just ones said, public sells for ninety nine cents. Yeah. I said, Do you think that we could adjust this? Because I I really don't feel like this is fair. Mind you, by this point I've probably spent I'd say twenty five hundred bucks in their establishment yeah. by this point. And um they pretty much blew it off, ignored me, and still charged me anyway. And I said, okay. And that was the last time we ever went back, and that place is not closed. <laughs> that could be a new revenue stream for us. Uh, selling bags at selling $8. bags at $8 what we buy at 10 cents. I wouldn't suggest it for your regulars, <laughs> but it did be, uh, it, again, it goes back to the experience, yeah, right? That's like just it, complimentary gift yeah. Exactly. And they do complimentary storage. It wasn't a good experience, but that's what I mean. Like, if we get a customer that complains yeah. about something, right? They're complaining about something they don't think is fair. It was unexpected or, you know, it wasn't really what they were planning for. We're going to fix it, whether it's our fault or not. And clearly, that was something they could absolutely control. There's a lot of things in real estate that's not in our control. Not just real can't. estate or wine, but any small business owner has yeah. to accommodate for the exception. Yeah. That, that doesn't make any sense. So, for me, I'm, I'm going to feel that. Like at the most intimate level, I'm going to feel that when my customer says something and I'm going to fix it and make it right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Those details are big. And Leo, you're right. Complimentary storage, you need to come pick up your wine. I, 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 I will be there eventually. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that. Speaking of uh, boxes, 
<laughs> so, but touching back on what you guys said something earlier, it's like this is why chain restaurants are so successful. They don't offer a great experience, but they offer a consistent experience. If I'm traveling and I know I go to some chain restaurant, I'm going to get the same menu, the same experience, the same greeting. Mostly everything's the same except tax um, at all of these places. So I will sometimes go to a, a mediocre place because I know it's going to be very consistent experience. It's like the, going all the way back to McDonald's as a franchise, right? Like, yeah. can you make a better hamburger than Ray Kroc? Probably. But it's the consistency. <laughs> you know what you're going to get. Yes. Go with what you know. It's not only a consistent experience for us, the next level is an exceptional experience every time. And what that means is taking that consistent experience and kind of tweaking it, catering it, elevating it to the customer that's sitting in front of you that particular moment. So tell me a little bit about your journey. You guys started in December of 2012. So we're knocking on what? This is going to be your seventh year, eighth year? At our seven year anniversary. So, and, uh, now our focus is go ahead. How was your, just tell me about your first year. Like, a lot of businesses are not necessarily successful the first year. Did, did you guys run at a profit the first year? Did you have yeah. a loss? Yes. We were actually in black day one. Great. Um, it was the business model that we set up that just allowed it. We figured out the secret sauce that allowed for maximizing profits and that's something that we were able to carry forward into our two locations and that's the reason why you purchase a franchise from us. No, I so, think the, for, from, from a con customer standpoint, I think you have two key things going at your first location which really helped you in ways that were unimaginable at the time. The first is you don't, you, you don't have your own bathroom in there. You basically... Your guests have to go to the neighboring bathroom of the, the central complex, so that means you have less clean, less space that you're renting for that. But I think the real, what, what clinched it for you, because I was scared when you guys first opened. I'm like, it's too small. Your overhead's going to be too high. But when you were allowed to put chairs and tables outside and rope off an area around to increase your footprint without having to increase your rent, that's when mm -hmm. I saw, like, you're going to succeed. Yeah, we put out 32 chairs, out, 32 seats outside. Well, plus you're taking that experience outside of your location and bring it's bringing them in. Yeah, absolutely. So do you care to share a little bit of the secret sauce? Like what, what did you guys have in mind when you, when you wrote down this whole business plan on how it was going to go? Because obviously you didn't just show up and say, let's see if this works. If you operate in the block the whole time, you're starting with a plan. Absolutely. I think Jamie always says it, when you plan to fail or when you, or when you fail to plan? Plan? Yeah. Your plan will fail. Yeah. Plan your work and work your plan. Plan your work. I'm a big, again, I'm an MBA. I'm a big believer in having a business plan, a solid business plan at that. So we were very fortunate. Part of our secret sauce, um, we do, uh, we have 200 wines by the glass without a preservation system. That's unheard of. That's part of the secret sauce for the proprietary franchise information. Um, the 100 craft beers, unheard of in a, in, a, in a wine shop. I mean, we're going up against, you know, World of Beer and Brass Tap that have that 100 mark. Um, yeah, but they have 100 normal beers. I mean, you guys' beers are very, like, I can't find them anywhere else. I, I get that quite frequently. So the other part of our secret sauce, Leah. Um, when you come in, you enjoy a bottle, you can't find it anywhere else. And we also act as real, real you know, um, uh, retailer, right? Retail, so mm -hmm. exactly. So they're able to purchase it from us, unable to find it elsewhere. So Where, where's most of your revenue stream come from? Is it the wine resales by selecting wine people will love? On premise, BCG is okay. uh, predominantly the bulk of our business. And so, what is what does the experience cost? And can you buy just one glass? Or are you getting a flight of beers? Or how does that work? What's interesting is another uh, part of our success is our wine list is different from anyone else's. Other establishments you can lend their Chardonnays are all together, their Pinots are together, their Cabs. We have a very boutique style of the wine list where all of the wines go by boutique collection. Homage to Ebor. Ebor is based on the Italian club, the Cuban club. You'll find our Italian and Spanish wines there. Hip and trendy, organic, sustainably farmed. You'll find our, our our hip and trendy wines there. So it's a fun wine list to read. So the experience starts the minute you hit the door with something different. So we took a concept or an idea of a wine bar and we kind of made it our own. We I love it. Give it a very unique. Yeah, exactly. Well, and our our price points, like you were asking about, 
uh, they can range anywhere from five dollars a glass or fifteen dollars a bottle, all the way up to forty-five dollars a glass to one hundred thirty-five a bottle. So you can literally pick what glass you want. Yes. Um, it's so what do you do with all the leftover wine? Do you create a house blend or sangria? No, or we. Work? Oh. <laughs> no, we do not. Uh, actually, it all gets sold. We um, our waste is probably down to three or four bottles a month. That's it. Wow. Um, yeah. Got it. So let's talk a little bit about, um, would you mind sharing like what your revenues are like? And then we'll get into a little bit of the franchise stuff on what somebody can expect. Uh, the first year you guys opened, what was your, what was your profit like? Do you know offhand? Um, our profit, it, we're definitely solid without getting into specific numbers. We were able to, um, basically recover our full, full amount of our investment in a year, in one year. And by year four, yeah, and by year four, we were, with the retained earnings, we were able to open up Seminole Heights cash. I love it. So when we come back after this break, let's chat a little bit about what goes into your franchise system. How can you help your franchisees set up to succeed? And then what areas you're thinking about going into? You're listening to Tampa Home Talk, our off-air number, in case you'd like to reach us or our guest, 813-377-2775. You can call or text us at 813-377-2775. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, good morning. Welcome back. This is an exciting, uh, quaffable hour of Tampa Home Talk as we're here with the Society Wine Bar of Michael and Jamie. Let's talk about the meat you got potatoes. Got it right that time, Leo. The, good so job. Talk about the meat and potatoes and the bread and butters of the franchising, the, 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 the money talk aspect of this. Yeah, so what's your process? What's your systems like? How much would somebody need to go into That's business with questions. you? That's a lot of questions. One question at a time. What are you looking for? <laughs> It, those are all excellent questions and things that are probably some of our most frequently asked questions is one is how what is your uh, startup costs what are you what are you expecting to our initial investment and what is it well we uh ex go ahead okay absolutely um according to our franchise disclosure document or fpd the franchise fee is forty five thousand dollars you can get into one of these units for less than, than two hundred fifty thousand dollars, one fifty to two fifty, and net worth is at two fifty as well. So it's a very reasonable as far as investments go. Comparable franchises. We're actually a little bit lower on the on the on the spectrum for investments because, like Leo said, we can operate under a very small footprint, which is a, a, a strong positive, as you know, being in real estate um, regarding overhead, expenditure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, uh, the reason that someone franchises is because we mitigate the risk. The process, the systems are all in place. The marketing, the advertising, all taken care of. How to run a wine fest, how to do a grand opening. The operations manuals. For you. Well, it's like hiring a coach, right? That's already figured it out. You got the blueprint on how to execute the play. Exactly. Right. We uh, execute their reviews. <laughs> we do training. We have a proprietary uh, course university which is a two-week training program for the uh, franchise owners as well as their staff. So we can get a lot of support. That's like franchise versus going independent. Now, support, the training, the, training, the advertising, yeah. all of it. Jamie, you're t how much was the, um, you said the initial upfront cost with everything is around 150 to 250 Yes, it all, yeah. On location, how much of a build-out, where are you at? How much is your first month rent? What's your square, you know, price per square? What sort of uh, cap, what sort of bar top do you want? Do you want just the uh, bar top like we have, which is our base model yeah. in our South Tampa location, if or do you want to drop it more? With light, yeah. it's gonna be expensive, right? Exactly. So, what can someone expect to earn? Like, should they expect to be in the black if they follow your systems the first year? Very. Say the ROI, you should have your return on your investment in eighteen months. Yeah. It's not a bad deal. And then yeah. it's profit from there. Now, is that considering the owner working in the business, or is that 100% someone else in it? No, let's talk about that. We have something called an owner added benefit. If the owner does work in the business, obviously you're saving payroll for a manager. Mm -hmm. And then also you're making tips. You can make, you know, depending on the volume of your wine bar, $500, $750, $1,000 a week in tips. So if an owner chooses to work in a higher volume wine bar and is pulling in $1,000 a week in tips, that's an additional. Fifty-two thousand a year in, in revenue for the owner. So, so get your ROI back fairly quicker. 
So your numbers are factoring someone else actually running the business, having a manager. If someone's in there, they could expect to break even probably less than a year, right? Um, Correct. Yeah. I love it. How do you find these managers? I mean, that's that's the tough stuff. And uh, so, so ownawinebar.com is our website. We're actively marketing the ownawinebar.com site. Um, we are uh, in all of the uh, wine schools for potential students that have a passion for wine to give them an opportunity to open up their own wine bars. And believe it or not, a lot of our growth so far since we're a new franchise award um, has been organic. People come in the wine bar, they fall in love with the wine bar, they have a passion for wine, and then we help guide them on their journey. Jamie, did you say you're doing this with students as well? Yeah, so uh, wine students. We had an interest. Uh, well, actually, our first franchisee was a student of wine. We met her at a small year day school here in Tampa. So someone, I guess it would be safe to say they're probably borrowing the money, right? They're not fronting 150000 cash. I don't want to say we offer financing. There is financing available, absolutely. Well, so how much cash would someone need to actually open a franchise? Like liquid cash. About 150 is what we're looking at. Okay. So well. Cash or be a loan. No, that's what I mean. Like, if because they can obviously get like an SBA loan or you know some right. type of loan. But how much? What's the minimum cash contribution they would need to start a franchise? One fifty. One fifty. Okay. Yeah. Yep. One fifty. Does yeah. And then depending, like Michael said, on all the other nuances, they could be up to two fifty, depending and, and, a small location that may have specific requirements. Alone and some of these students that you mentioned, they're they're already established. A lot of times, like with the first franchisee, she was established in a different market, and she was going back for as a passion for wine. And so, it's not necessarily when you think of a student at like twenty one to twenty four years old. Mm -hmm. right. They're usually uh, people around the age of thirty five and up. Okay, so they've got the cash from fusing. Yes. Correct. The people that go to wine school these days, for sure. That's a good point. So. How do you choose or agree or allow what franchises to open where? Like, do you put in some market research? Do you help the franchise or do that to make sure they're opening in the right location? Exactly. Yes. Uh, site selection is critical. We're using a real estate company, but there are other realtors, independent realtors, um, absolutely, that can do the same thing. Research the demographics. Know what a good, we have a, a demographic sheet of what we look for um, for the area that we'd like the owners to open in. So we do, uh, we help them with that research and site selection. That's another benefit that we provide being a franchisee. What's one of the number one things you're, you're looking at in the demographics? Is it the age? Is it a certain income? For us, income is important, but I find that it's a matter of foot traffic and, mm -hmm. uh, and just overall traffic in general, getting into a high volume area. You love what? We love feeders. We love to be feeders. We mm -hmm. call them feeders. Things that are close to, for example, Ybor City, we're fed by all those restaurants. There's 100 restaurants in Ybor City. We're the only wine bar. So we're either to make a perfect date night, the aperitif, for the digestive. You come with us for wine first, then go have your lovely dinner, or perhaps your dinner, and then come and have dessert and port wine. Also, movie theaters, um, uh, retail stores, things that women, women are women-centric for wine, although both genders, but there's a little bit more of a percentage for the female gender. So we look for things like that hair salons, clothing boutiques, um, restaurants. Entertainment districts. Uh, you know. mm -hmm. Now, while you, Entertainment great. while you guys have food, I mean, there's not a whole lot of entertainment. I would put you more in the entertainment category than I would food, even though you have some small bites. And a lot, a lot of the, like, didn't um, the improv, are they, they're not there anymore, right? In improv Ebor? is still there. The improv still there. They are still there. They're okay. really strong. And then what about the... Is the movie theater still there, or no. did they close? The movie theater they is closed, right? on its way out. It's no, it's done. It's done, done. I knew it, was, it, it turned from a 24 to a 12 to a 6 to a 2 to a... Nothing. Nothing. It's, yeah, exactly. It's unfortunate. So how many locations do you guys have, Jamie? We own three. You have three, and then have you franchised some more out? Yes, we have three markets sold that are under development. And we have a few others that are pending right now. Can you say where those are, or not quite yet? Absolutely. Brandon? Sarasota and the Channel Side District. I think your Sarasota will do well. Where is that? Is it going to be near St. Armand Circle in that area? They're looking there. It might be a multiple three, of what we call a three-pack unit deal. St. Armand is on the list. Lakewood Ranch is on the list. And Main Street is on the list. We love Sarasota. Yeah, definitely. Demographic research is wonderful there. Then an interesting uh, prospect that we have is actually up in Memphis, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee, in Lake, in Lake Lynn, Tennessee, which is a really cool community. It's 
mixed mixed development between a lot of residential, a lot of uh, commercial, and just yeah. just absolutely brilliant. It's on a nice uh, size lake with everything that's built around the lake, where it's almost like uh, canals going between the buildings. Wow, that's so it's nice. Like, yeah, it's beautiful. It looks like a small Venice. I wonder, it, what's one of the hardest part? Is it getting the beer and wine license, or what's the hardest part about opening up a new location? No. Beer and wine license is easy. It's easy. As long as you have, uh, you're in good moral standing and without a <laughs> felony record. Imagine that. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. they, tend to, they tend to like wine bars they tend not to like nightclubs they breweries are like hip and coming so they like those but when you're a wine bar there's a certain like from a city standpoint there's, there's an a elegance certain element, elegance right? there's yeah. a certain respectableness there's a certain affluence associated with people sitting around sipping wine and munching on cheese they don't really look at those like nightclubs so what is what was you didn't you cut out a little bit jamie what was that um, also, we're a two COP license, which is just beer and wine, versus a four COP, which is hard liquor spirits. Leo's right; it's a whole different connotation for a wine bar. Not yeah. only that, we're a, yeah, a restaurant more or less. Also, landlords and owners of buildings, when we go in, love the idea that it is just wine and beer and not liquor. Um, and it, like you said, a little bit of the respectability with the owner, building ownership, and we found it very. A lot of people enjoy the fact that it's just two COP. So what's the hardest part of opening a franchise? Like, what's the one thing that hangs you up the most? What's the biggest challenge? That's interesting. Michael, what would you say it is? Opening a franchise or starting the franchise? Like, we'll start, no, I mean, like, you're talking about like your franchising you're this now, right? Going into other locations. Um, so you've obviously figured some stuff out. But what's the biggest challenge when you're looking to open a new franchise? For us or the franchisee? Uh, both. Yeah. Like, is it is it finding the right franchisee? It, it like, is what, finding what's the your right, challenges? It right now we find that it is finding the right franchisee, someone who wants to who wants to have the passion for it. Um, they have to have a drive. They they have to understand that it is a partnership with the franchisor with us, but it is their own business, and they have to take responsibility and they have to do the work to get up to speed. If you don't know about wine, you have to take the initiative to get to know wine. wine. We can provide you the materials. We can provide you with all the information to know it, but if you don't want to sit there, read it, understand it, commit it to memory, we can't do that work for you. So the biggest challenge is finding the right franchisee? Yeah. Would you agree with that, Jamie? Yeah, but as a franchisee, that's their biggest challenge and their biggest responsibility. Our biggest responsibility, not really a challenge, have a doubt is supporting the franchisees i'm very big on support that's critical their success is paramount to my brand and what are some of the things you guys do to support them other than the education the training the blueprint like we, are you there in the grind with them yeah we, we we are we help them with their grand opening we also have franchise business consultants that go in and help them as well with everything that they may need we curate the menu for them we curate the house to how to run a wine society, how to run a wine club, as they're, how to run a wine center. Yeah, and as they're doing their site locations, searching, um, getting, oh, preparing to open, even before then, like all their pre-opening stuff, we invite them to work in the wine bar behind the counter working with the guests to get the hands-on experience. Um, we'll put them on the schedule. That way they can see what it's like, showing them how their schedules are created. So we start the training process day one. So, so they're, they're working in one of the other locations yeah. until they get up morning. That's mm -hmm. a great idea. And they're getting hands-on experience. Cool. Well, you're listening to Tampa Home Talk. I'm so excited to um, highlight you guys on the show today. We're with Society Wine Bar. We're here with Michael Bohm and Jamie Kozar. When we come back right after the break, we'll answer any final questions that you guys may have. Our off-air number, if you want to just text any of those questions, is 813-377-2775. You can call or text us with any comments, questions, ideas to 813-377-2775. We'll be back right after this break. You're listening to Tampa Home Talk. We're here with Society Wine Bar. Stick around. On Tampa Home Talk, all the way now till 10 o'clock. We don't have much time left. I got to ask this question. Uh, being right around the corner, 2020, what is a good choice of wine to bring in that New Year celebration? Well, for us, we, it, one of the most popular... 
Yep, one of the most popular when uh, every year somebody's ordering a nice bottle of champagne. Uh, it is. It is. It's a fun. Uh, he said black bubbles? Yeah. It's exactly what it sounds like. Tell me about that. Well, it. Wow. So what they do is they uh, f uh, do a secondary fermentation in the bottle. And with a black bubble, with a Syrah, which is a red wine. And so you have a sparkling red wine. It sounds amazing. And is it stronger since it's been through that process twice? No, not stronger. It's just carbonated and nice and fizzy. Sounds awesome. What's your what's one of your favorites? One of your top wines over there. Like what's your best seller? Uh, like three different questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my favorite, I'm an Italian girl, just so you know. So I'm an Amarone, Barolo, Napolitello, Rapato, that type style. Michael's a Spanish guy, actually. Right? Yeah, I, I do enjoy my priorats. Mm -hmm. My Riojas. And what's your number one selling wine? My number one selling wine right now. Uh, it's probably the Society Red. It's Is that a, your house? Yeah, it's not... It, I don't like to use the term house. Okay. But it is our own private labeled... One of our private labeled wines. Um, Where is it from? Excellent quality. It is out of California. Okay. Made by Scotto Cellars for us. And it is a... For those who like uh, some Pinot Noirs that are a little bit more sweet and fruit forward... This is the perfect replacement for like a Mayomi Pinot Noir because it is Pinot Noir Syrah blend and not 100% Pinot. Um, you know why I think your house, and I hate the term house wine, but you, but you know why I think it does better? Why is that? I'll give you my opinion, right? Not the wine expert. But I think it's very much a when in Rome kind of thing. But for yeah. me, it would be, right? Like if I was in there, I would want to try like, what's your label first? I'd want to try it. Yeah, and what we did... Yeah. Yeah. That. So, so to give you an example, one of the ones that I liked, it was my favorite that we did at the other place that's now closed. They did an orange sangria and it was, it came from, it was local, a little bit more sweet on the red side, but it was yeah. really good. And when we say house wine, our, our society, red, our society wines, we have a, the red blend, we have a Pinot Noir and we also have a Chardonnay. It's, not the cheapest wines on our list, but they're not the most expensive, but they're very approachable. They start at anywhere from $10 a glass or 30 a bottle or $12 a glass and 36 a bottle. Yeah, As you fair. notice, the trend is our bottle prices are only three times the glass price. Right. And you'll find that our prices are between restaurant and retail. Love it. I love it. Well, I love that you guys spend a lot of time to pick which wines you're going to bring, right? Absolutely. Plus, they, plus they have uh, usually it's 25% off during some of their events. And you have an event coming up, don't you? We do. Our New Year's Eve party. So tell me about that. That's coming up, and then we have wine and chocolate fest too, Leo, for Valentine's Day that weekend, that Sunday. That's our next big one. We just had our wine fest for Christmas. Our New Year's Eve, fantastic. Yes. So tell me about New Year's Eve. You guys are having a party. What's what's going on there? Are you having any entertainment? Well, yeah, Roaring Twenties. Of course, that's the theme. So we're doing a Roaring Twenties gala. We hired a DJ that's going to be playing big bands, dance floor, outside under the stars. Uh, complimentary food, bubbles. We curated an open wine bar menu. Nice. Uh, it's reasonable because it's only $75 a person. Usually things for New Year's Eve are crazy. Mm -hmm. That includes an open wine bar from 8 p.m. Wow. to 1 a.m. Everybody's doing the, the roaring 20s. That's really the theme. It makes sense. We are hitting 20s. Yes, we um, are. And it's been 100 years ago, if you think about that. It's so crazy. The Keller Williams holiday party was actually the Roaring 20s theme. We should give away some tickets. I feel like we should we give are. away some tickets. Two so, tickets. Thank you guys so much for Society Wine Absolutely. Bar. $150 value. We're going to give away two tickets to your New Year's Eve bash so you can get all dolled up in your Roaring 20s outfit, have an open bar, and enjoy the big band. And you'll have to share your experience on the show after you go. So call or text right now if you just simply text Society Wine Bar first ones that send us the message we are going to give you those two tickets for the new year's eve holiday party two free tickets worth 150 bucks 813-377-2775 just call or text first one to come through for society wine bar 813-377-2775 again first ones to call or text we're going to give you two tickets to the new year's eve bash at Society Wine Bar. Thank you guys for giving that away. Absolutely. And that location is at our Ybor City location. Our other two locations will be closed uh, for New Year's Eve. 
so we can all en- so our whole entire wine bar family can enjoy it together. Now, what's your capacity? How many people can you have there when you sold out on tickets? Our um, max cap, I believe, the fire marshal says our max cap is 180, 200. Because of the outside. Yeah. We have a lot of- and I don't think we're selling that many tickets. I think we're sell. I think we put a limit at 100 tickets for this event. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we, we want to give two of those away. Make sure you mention that you heard us on Tampa Home Talk. Our off-air number is 813-377-2775. You can call or text and ask for your two free tickets to Society Wine Bar's New Year's Eve Bash roaring 20s theme again 813-377-2775 i've had so much fun having you guys on this hour i enjoyed it this was a blast jamie i wish you could have made it here with us i know you're a little jet lag coming from the other cold coast yes exactly and i got in late last night but i'm so glad to be participating via phone come and check us out at the wine bar i definitely will i've not been there so i'm going to add it to my list for sure and i'll let you guys know when i'm coming please do we look forward to having you And if you want to get some information on the franchise opportunities, feel free to reach out as well. We'll get you connected with Michael and Jamie. Our off-air number is 813-377-2775. Just let us know you're looking at the franchise opportunity for Society Wine Bar. And that's at ownawinebar.com. Great. Perfect. 813-377-2775. And we will also post your information, your ownawinebar.com, on our website and our Facebook. Any final thoughts? It's our last show of 2019. Thank you for having us. It's been fun and uh, probably should, we should have done this sooner. Yeah, definitely. We should run down a top 10 list. Top 10 what? I don't know. Top 10 somethings. We should run down. We still, have, we still have 20 seconds left, don't we? No, I don't think so. I think we're, we're it's a wrap. All right. 813-377-2775. I am in the other room from that one, so I'll find out if we have a winner, and we will let you guys know. We'll tell Pat George and announce that as soon as we get off the air here. 813-377-2775. I'm your host, Katrina Madewell, joined today by Jamie Kozar and Michael Bone with Society Wine Bar, and of course, my sidekick, Mr. Leo Kane with Barrel Engineering and Inspections. This this is our last show of 2019. We got some awesome stuff coming up for you in 2020. So be on the lookout for that going into January. Have a very safe New Year's, everyone. Don't forget to take an Uber or a Lyft when you need it. And remember, love where you live, or I'm going to fix it. Welcome home. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.